Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear students, I am Dr. Ravichandran Swami, Professor of Anatomy, Karpagam Faculty of Medical Sciences and Research, Coimbatore. I welcome you to this session on pericardium. Pericardium is a very important topic, both in terms of exam point of view and clinical practice point of view. Let me begin my lecture with a case scenario. A 45-year-old man was brought to the casualty with acute onset of severe chest pain. On examination, his respiration and pulse were rapid and the heart sounds were faintly audible. X-ray chest showed a globular enlarged shadow suggestive of fluid around the heart. Now the diagnosis of this clinical case is pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion is collection of fluid around the heart inside a potential space called as the pericardial cavity. To diagnose this condition and to treat this condition, the knowledge of anatomy of the pericardium is very important. So, we will move on to the topic right now. The word pericardium is derived from the Greek language. The pericardium is located in the middle mediastinum, behind the manubrium, sternum and second to sixth costal cartilages and in front of fifth to eighth vertebral bodies. The word pericardium is derived from peri and cardium. Peri means around and cardium refers to the heart. So put together pericardium is a covering around the heart. Now I request you to concentrate on the picture on to your left side. Here the anterior chest wall has been removed exposing the mediastinum. Here you can see the heart which is being surrounded by a covering that is called as the pericardium. On either side you see the lung, this is the diaphragm. Here you see the trachea, these are the blood vessels, the great blood vessels. Now what is mediastinum? Mediastinum is the space between the lungs in the thoracic cavity. It is subdivided into superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum. The inferior mediastinum is further subdivided into anterior, middle and posterior mediastinum. Look this picture here, here you are seeing the section of the lateral view of the thoracic cavity. In front you see the manubrium and the body of the sternum, behind you see the vertebral body, this is the heart. An imaginary line passing between the manubrium and the body of the sternum, that is the sternal angle to a plane between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebra divides the thoracic cavity into a superior mediastinum and an inferior mediastinum. The inferior mediastinum is further subdivided into anterior mediastinum, middle mediastinum where you have the heart of the pericardium and posterior mediastinum. Now what is the definition of pericardium? Pericardium is defined as a fibrocerous sac enclosing the heart and the root of the great vessels. Now in this picture, this is the heart and this is the covering which is a fibrocerous sac which we call it as the pericardium and this has been cut and opened to expose the heart and these are the great vessels which you see here. The pericardium is 
subdivided into an outer fibrous layer and an inner serous layer. The inner serous layer is further subdivided into visceral pericardium or epicardium and a parietal pericardium. This picture gives you a schematic representation of the layers of the pericardium. Here you can see the outermost layer that is the fibrous pericardium. Then here you are seeing the two layers of the serous pericardium the inner visceral layer and the outer parietal layer. This is the myocardium and here you can faintly see the endocardial outline. The fibrous pericardium is an open sac. It is pierced by blood vessels namely the arch of the iota, pulmonary vessels and vena cavae. The fibrous pericardium is made up of fibrous tissue and that is why it derives its name the fibrous pericardium. On to its inner side the parietal layer of serous pericardium is attached. The main function of the fibrous pericardium is to protect the heart from sudden overfilling and also to safeguard the heart from diastolic dysfunction and it also prevents over expansion of the heart. The fibrous pericardium has got an apex and a base. Now in this picture you can see the upper part this is the apex, this is blunt and it corresponds to the level of sternal angle of Louis and above if you trace it blends with the root of the great vessels and also it is continuous with the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia. The deep cervical fascia you know it has got different layers the prevertebral layer, pretracheal layer, carotid sheath etc. So this uh, fibrous pericardium continues itself with the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia above. Now you can see this picture here, this is just to show the apex of the fibrous pericardium which corresponds to the level of the sternal angle of Lewis. In this picture you can see the heart, the sternum, the clavicle and the vertebral bodies, this is the diaphragm. Now if you see, if you trace the pericardium, it, is, it will be continuous with the great vessels and also with the pretracheal layer of the deep cervical fascia. Now that is about the apex. Now going to the base. The base of the fibrous pericardium is broad. It is fused to the central tendon of the diaphragm. Now here you can see this is the uh, diaphragm and this is the central tendon of the diaphragm and the base of the fibrous pericardium is fused to the central tendon of diaphragm. In front, the peri pericardium, the fibrous pericardium is attached to the sternum. So in this picture you can see this is the sternum, this is the heart within the pericardium. Now it is connected to the uh, sternum by two pericardial ligaments, the superior sternopericardial ligament and inferior sternopericardial ligament. Relations on the posterior aspect behind, we see the fibrous pericardium is forming the anterior boundary of the posterior mediastinum. So this picture shows you the anterior, middle and posterior mediastinum. The heart and the fibrous pericardium is located in the middle mediastinum. Now this is the posterior aspect of the fibrous pericardium and here it is forming the anterior boundary of the posterior mediastinum. Now if you remove the heart and the pericardium, you will find few structures behind that. That is the structures which are present in the posterior mediastinum or related 
posteriorly to the fibrous pericardium. Now let us see one by one what are those structures. So in this picture if you see carefully this is the trachea which is getting bifurcated into the right and left principal bronchus. Then you see the esophagus which is piercing the diaphragm and entering into the stomach and here this corner you are seeing the descending thoracic iota. Now the relations on the posterior aspect of the fibrous pericardium these structures are related namely the principal bronchi, the esophagus, the descending thoracic iota. Over the esophagus we have a plexus of nerves that we call as the esophageal nerve plexus. Apart from that there are three more structures which are related posteriorly namely the thoracic duct, azygos veins and hemiazygos veins. On either side of the pericardium we have the two lungs. So the relations on either side we have the mediastinal surface of the lung and the covering of the lung that is the pleura, the mediastinal pleura is related on either side. Also it is related to the phrenic nerve which goes to supply the diaphragm and the pericardiacophrenic vessels. So these structures are also related on either side. Now coming to the next layer that is the serous pericardium. The serous pericardium is a thin double layered membrane. It is lined by mesothelium. As we already saw it is divided into an outer layer called the parietal layer and an inner layer called the visceral layer. The outer layer is fused with the fibrous pericardium, the deep aspect of the fibrous pericardium. The inner layer is fused to the heart except along the grooves of the heart. These two layers they become continuous with each other at the root of the great vessels. Now if you look at this picture this is the heart, these are the great vessels. So this is the serous pericardium you can see it is in two layers visceral layer and parietal layer. There is a potential space between these two layers and this space is called as the pericardial cavity. The pericardial fluid is present in the pericardial cavity and it acts as a lubricant. Now a little bit of uh, embryology. Originally the serous sac was like a balloon, it is closed on all aspects. During development as the heart develops, the heart is invaginating into the sac that is the serous sac without breaching its continuity. Now imagine if you insinuate or invaginate your hand into a balloon the balloon will take a shape like this with two layers, an outer layer and inner layer. Similarly, when the heart is invaginating into this balloon like serous sac, this serous sac is assuming or taking two layers, has got two layers, an outer layer and an inner layer. The outer layer is the parietal layer and the inner layer is the visceral layer and the space in between becomes the pericardial cavity. Now in this process the atrium of the heart enters the sac last. At this point as the atrium enters the sac the inner layer is getting reflected as the outer layer. The continuity between the two layers of the serous pericardium, the parietal and visceral layers is established in the form of two tubes. The first tube is surrounding the arterial end, these tubes I mean the arterial tube and the venous tube. 
So, the arterial tube is formed by the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the venous tube is formed by the four pulmonary veins and the vena cava. In the pericardium, there are some spaces or sinuses, pockets. These are called as the sinuses of pericardium or pockets of the pericardium. We have two sinuses, one is called as the transverse pericardial sinus and the other one is called as the oblique pericardial sinus. Now, in this picture, I want you to orient yourself first. So, this is the heart here, this is the left ventricle, the, the heart has been slightly lifted up, the fibrous pericardium, this is the outline of the pericardium, fibrous pericardium and it has been opened to expose the heart and the heart has been lifted up. Now here what are the structures you see, this is the left ventricle, this is the coronary sinus, this is the atrium, then here we have the pulmonary veins, this is the pulmonary trunk, this is the ascending iota and this is the superior vena cava. This picture is very important to orient yourself or to know the boundaries of the two sinuses, the transverse pericardial sinus and the oblique pericardial sinus. Now what is transverse pericardial sinus? The transverse pericardial sinus is a transverse gap between the two tubular reflections of the serous pericardium, that is between the arterial and venous ends of the tube. Now you can see this picture, you have already seen that, this is the arterial end formed by the pulmonary trunk and the iota, this is the venous area. In between there is a transverse gap. This transverse gap is called as the transverse pericardial sinus. Now what are the boundaries of the transverse sinus? Look at this picture this is showing you the transverse sinus here. It is bounded anteriorly by the ascending iota and pulmonary trunk that is the arterial end and posteriorly by the superior vena cava that is the venous part. And inferiorly it is bounded by the upper surface of the left atrium. So, this is the transverse pericardial sinus. Now, this picture you can see the finger is being inserted or passing, the finger is passing through the transverse sinus. So, in front we have the ascending iota and the pulmonary trunk and behind we have the superior vena cava, inferiorly will be the atrium, the left atrium. Now, you can observe this animated picture. This is the fibrous pericardium which has been cut open to expose the heart. This is the pulmonary trunk, this is the ascending iota with its branches, behind you see the trachea. Now if a finger is inserted behind the ascending iota and pulmonary trunk, we are entering into the transverse sinus. Now here you can faintly see the vena cava also. What is the importance of this transverse sinus? During cardiac surgery, a ligature may be passed through the transverse sinus around the iota and pulmonary trunk to control hemorrhage. Now coming to the oblique sinus. The oblique sinus is actually situated behind the heart you know this picture already, so this is the boundary of the pericardium, this is a pericardial cavity, the inferior surface of the heart, the left ventricle, here you see the atrium, the pulmonary veins, pulmonary trunk, iota and the vena cava. Now here this arrow is pointing into the oblique pericardial sinus. What are the boundaries of this oblique pericardial sinus. Anteriorly, it is bounded 
by the left atrium. Posteriorly, it is bounded by the parietal layer of the pericardium and also the esophagus. So, these two structures are forming its posterior boundary and on the inferior aspect, it is open into the general pericardial cavity. So, these are the boundaries of the oblique sinus. Now, if you look into this picture, I will repeat the structures again. This is the pericardium which has been cut open, this is the heart. Now, if you insert a finger just behind this heart, you are actually into the oblique pericardial sinus. You can compare these two pictures. So, this is the left ventricle, coronary sinus, the pulmonary veins, atrium, pulmonary trunk, then this is the iota and this is the vena cava. Now, what are the functions of pericardium? The first and foremost function of pericardium is it holds the heart in the thoracic cavity and therefore, it is also called as the cardiac seat belt. This way it prevents the movements of heart. It also acts as a shock absorber because of the pericardial fluid which is present in the pericardial cavity. Over expansion of heart during increased venous return or increased blood volume is prevented. So, these are the important functions of pericardium. Now, what are the contents of pericardium? So, we saw that the pericardium is a fibrocerous sac which encloses the heart. The main content therefore, is the heart along with the cardiac vessels and nerves. Then the blood vessels, the ascending iota, the pulmonary trunk, lower half of the superior vena cava, terminal part of the inferior vena cava and terminal parts of the pulmonary veins or the contents of pericardium. The next is we should know the blood supply of pericardium. As we already saw that the pericardium is divided into an outer fibrous layer and inner serous layer. The inner serous layer is further divided into visceral layer or epicardium and a parietal layer. Now, if you look at the blood supply of pericardium, the outer fibrous layer and the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is supplied by the internal thoracic artery and its branch the musculophrenic artery and also the descending branches from the descending iota. The venous drainage is by the azagos veins and internal thoracic veins. The visceral layer or the epicardium is supplied by the coronary arteries and the venous blood is drained by the coronary sinus. What is the nerve supply of pericardium? Similarly, the outer fibers and parietal is being supplied by the phrenic nerve and the visceral pericardium is supplied by the vagus and sympathetic nerves via coronary plexus. Now, I will be just talking to you briefly about the development of the transverse sinus and briefly the pericardium. Now, if you look at this picture, at a particular point of development, the developing embryo has got three layers. Let us take a random point and in that particular point onwards, we see there are three layers, ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. Now, you can see this is the ectoderm, this is the mesoderm and this is the endoderm. Here you see the amniotic cavity and this is the 
yolk sac cavity and in the center you see the notochord. At a later point the embryo appears like this. So, there is an endodermal tube we call that as the gut tube which is divided into foregut, midgut and hindgut. The mesoderm is here and the ectoderm is forming the neural structures. Now, the heart develops from the mesoderm that part of the mesoderm from where the heart develops is called as the cardiogenic area. So, this is the cranial end of the embryo, this is the caudal end of the embryo. Initially heart is seen in the form of two tubes the right and left endothelial tubes. These two tubes they soon fuse with each other and four dilatations are formed. The bulbous card is the ventricle, atrium and sinus venosus. So, these are the four dilatations. The bulbous card is forms the arterial end of the tube, the sinus venosus forms the venous end of the tube. Into the sinus venosus the umbilical vein, midline vein and cardinal vein they open. Now, at this stage the developing heart and the vessels. So, this is the first initially the heart is in the form of a tube, two tubes right tube and left tube they have fused and they form a heart tube single heart tube and this developing heart and the vessels associated with this heart tube are suspended from the posterior wall of the embryo by a layer of dorsal mesocardium. Now, this picture you are seeing the tube here. Let us take this as the posterior wall of the embryo and this tube is suspended from the posterior wall of the embryo by a layer of mesocardium that is the dorsal mesocardium. You can see the same picture here, another picture to show the development. You see the two tubes which I told you the right and left endothelial tubes, heart tubes, they have fused and there are four dilatations. This is the arterial end, this is the venous end and further changes are going to happen here and this is the dorsal mesocardium through which this heart tube is suspended to the posterior wall of the developing embryo. Now, what happens is this primitive heart tube or the early developing heart, the first stage is undergoing a folding into an S shaped loop. So, because of this folding the heart gradually gets its original shape. At this point there is a breakdown of central part of dorsal mesocardium between the arterial end and venous end of the developing heart. So, this breakdown is actually what we see as a transverse gap and that is the transverse sinus. So, this is the arterial end here, this is the venous end, this is the mesocardium and as the heart tube assumes this S shaped loop there is a breakdown. So, in the dorsal mesocardium and because of this breakdown in the central part the transverse sinus is formed. So, this picture shows the uh, formation of the, the transverse sinus. So, this is the endocardial heart tube, the preliminary heart tube, this is the pericardial cavity and the tube is undergoing a small S shaped loop. So, while it is undergoing an S shaped loop, it is invaginating into this cavity. So, that is why we have the formation of two layers of the serous pericardium as it invaginates, the heart is invaginating into the pericardial cavity, the, the serous sac which is the fibrous pericardium is uh, now assuming two 
layers, an outer layer and an inner layer. The out, outer layer is called as the parietal layer and the inner layer is called as the visceral layer and the space between these two is called as the pericardial cavity. And at the same time because of the fold the, the dorsal mesocardium is breaking at a point the central aspect and that forms a transverse gap between the arterial and the venous ends and that results in the formation of the transverse sinus. Now this picture we have already seen, let us assume this as a balloon, the, the fibrous serous sac, the serous sac particularly, the heart slowly, the developing heart as it invaginates, the serous sac gets two layers, an outer layer and inner layer. Now what are the clinical importance? So we began with a case scenario, the pericardial effusion. The what is the applied importance of this topic? So in the beginning we saw a clinical condition, the pericardial effusion. So what is pericardial effusion? Collection of fluid around the heart is called pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. Fluid accumulates in a potential space called the pericardial cavity. The collected fluid compresses the heart, reduces ventricular filling and results in reduced cardiac output. Now here you can see there is a build up of fluid in the potential space. What are the clinical features of pericardial effusion? Dyspnea that is shortness of breath, tachycardia, increased heart rate, tachypnea, increased respiration, chest pain or heaviness over the chest. So these are the clinical features of pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion can be a medical emergency which may lead to cardiac arrest and death. The fluid accumulated around the heart in the pericardial cavity can be aspirated by passing a needle in one of the following routes, a subcostal route or a parasternal route. In the subcostal route, needle is inserted through the left of the costosified angle with an upward inclination of about 45 degrees and in the parasternal route the needle is inserted through the left of fourth or fifth intercostal space close to the lateral margin of the sternum. Intracardiac injection is also preferred through this route and that brings us to the uh, end of today's lecture. What did we learn today? We began the lecture session with a clinical case scenario of pericardial effusion. Then we discussed about the definition of pericardium, location of pericardium, what are the layers of pericardium, the blood supply, nerve supply and applied aspects of pericardium. Thank you.